All right, greetings to everyone. We are so happy to get together again. And uh, today, is, today is a very special occasion, as always. It is a very special occasion every time then we are opening our show. So uh, I, must, uh, I must say that um, I live here at Midway more than 10 years, more than 10 years. And through all these years, during all these years, I'm very comfortably used to the fact and to the idea that if uh, something artsy or fun or cool happening at Midway, be the show, music event, screening of something very interesting and nice, it is always Bill here, right in the midst of it, with his artistic intuition, his mastership of art making, his uh, encouraging kind word, and there are a lot of things on that list. And um, so it goes this way. Like uh, it is always happening with the people who have uh, a special talent of making things happen. You know, it is really a special talent and you absolutely possesses this one. Like uh, all of the special people who have this talent, this is one of many of their fine talents. And talking about many of the fine talents of William Fries, artist, musician, thinker, and you will see what else a little bit later. Today we have a very, a very special and happy occasion. Uh, when just before our hungry eyes, all these fine talents will be opening, showing themselves and showing how it plays out the real beauty of simple things, events and eventualities. So take it. All right, thank you, Olga. Thank you. And, um... Thank you for the introduction and all of your efforts with this monthly 89 Zoom meeting uh, gathering series um, that features our creatives over at the Midway Artist Collective Building. Um, on a personal perspective, I'm, I'm just astonished how you were able to simultaneously produce this monthly Zoom while also curating the current group show in the Midway Gallery, Midway Collective 21-22, that's, that's gonna be up until, I think, January 22nd. Um, you, you inspire. Um, thank you also, Hannah and Mario, for um, the technical aspects of this gathering. Um, and for Maria, I'm not sure if she's on, for answering some last minute questions that I had. Um, so to kind of dive into it, let's see if we can get the fancy screen up here. Thank you to my assistant, Sarah Dean. We're just working on that. Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Yeah, all good. Great. Um, so my background, um, as some of you might know in the house, um, I grew up in the Hudson River Valley area <clears throat> in New York, uh, moved to Boston with a lot of help in the early 90s. And later, um, as an older student, graduated from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts and Tufts University. Uh, while at the museum school, as we call it, I studied with um, Joyce McDaniels, Mags Harries, and Fritz Buhner. Um, what so very fortunate to, um, to land at the museum school during that time. I graduated in 2003 and then moved to Midway in um, May 2005, just when the building uh, reopened for occupancy. Um, there's a long list, but 
uh, some of the artists that inspire me. Um, they go back a little bit, but not too far back. Uh, Giacometti, Paul Clay, Barbara Kruger, uh, of course, Christo, and local artists, uh, Peter Valentine and Alvin Long. Um, some of the places that I've exhibited are the uh, Norwood Space Center. I love that name. Uh, New Alliance Studios, New England School of Art and Design, Four Point Gallery at Summer Street, uh, the Prouts Neck Biannual Art Show, Arsenal Center for the Arts, Oni Gallery, and others. Um, additionally, in the outside world, in more of a discreet statement, um, there's many small piquito, little objects that I have placed throughout Boston in Cambridge, as Krista would call them, they are gentle disturbances. Um, my two mantras over the years, and, and I think they started to evolve more when I did get to Midway and have been surrounded by so many remarkable artists. Um, so I kind of repeat these mantras at least a few times a day is that I believe that art resonates most when it initiates an unanticipated dialogue with the viewer. And the second one is, I believe that a good question is far greater than a great answer. Um, as far as structure goes for tonight, uh, I'd like to present a couple pictures of one particular sculpture, say a few words, um, answer questions or comments, then move on to the next sculpture. Um, as far as brief comment, as far as my process goes for site-specific works like we have downstairs uh, in our Midway Gallery. Um, I always like to investigate, initially investigate the potential site, which I call kind of a, a recon or reconnaissance, and then um, write and sketch down a few ideas, sometimes create a maquette, in other words, like a 3D working model, and then move into onto fabrication of the fully realized sculpture. Uh, the first three sculptures uh, are presented in the order. And then after that, there's some uh, 2D works and then some things that are currently happening, as I mentioned, downstairs in our gallery. All right. Mm -hmm. Whoops, there we go. The, the first one I'd like to present is a new address for the muses. Um, I think it's fitting because it because it, it's it's the first install that I created over here at Midway. Um, and it was intended to act as a beacon for the muses to locate and hopefully visit the new artists that were moving into Midway. Oops, wrong way. There we go. Um, so, for example, here's some of my early writings, which would be, I'll translate the handwriting for you, uh, a bunch of grapes dangling, translucent bodies glowing from sunlight changing throughout daylight hours, a barometer. Um, I do, whenever possible, love to use natural lighting on my work. It's not always possible, but um, but that's that's a big point for me. Um, this was the space that I chose to put um, the piece in, and it's the uh, east entrance um, to our first floor gallery. And of course, facing east, not yet obstructed by tall buildings, um, the amount of sunlight that pours into the space, just remarkable. Um, and you can kind of get an idea of the height 
the materials that I'm using, you can see there's a block and tackle way up there. There's some rope. And my thoughtful assistant is actually holding the sculpture. The sculpture itself, there's another little quick diagram of the space. The sculpture itself is also made out of old, very oversized mogul based. So it's the large base incandescent light bulbs, each one um, slightly larger than a football. Um, and the covering that's going over them is a fiberglass cloth. So it permits the light to come in. And then what I used was like a clear kind of latex binder um, to fold them inside the uh, fiberglass cloth, almost like a giant ravioli. Um, I know it sounds a little crude, but that's how it worked. But the great thing with working with that particular binder that I didn't know was going to happen, it actually, um, when, it, when it set up, when it dried, it actually shrank to the form of the bulbs. And I was, none of them broke, but I was very excited about that. So you really can see like the orb type um, contour. And that is the final installed piece. You can see a little bit on the left, some of the beautiful natural light coming in. So that was probably pretty early in the morning, a lot earlier than I typically get up. Um, and the piece itself, you can kind of gauge the scale because those are obviously cinder blocks in the back. So it, it, it dangles maybe seven or eight feet, um, but is very light. And uh, it inhabited the space for many years. And I, I know I've had a lot of good ideas being at Midway, so I'd like to think that, that it's worked pretty well. Um, any questions or comments before I proceed to the next uh, couple slides, next sculpture? That was the first thing that I that I bumped into uh, coming to live at Midway, Bill. That was oh. the sculpture. Wonderful. Uh, it, was, it was good. <laughs> what year did that? Uh, what year did it come down, Bill? Uh, let's see. It's probably about two, maybe three years ago. I think they were doing some renovation to the left wall and they needed um access to that right yeah i think i remember now nice to see you alan good to see you cool, so, man. i just have a, a question uh what is the um uh, what if he what would you need to bring it back what would you need to do to bring it back somewhere because it is actually uh, a nice piece of art that should be displayed um, somewhere in Midway, but. I agree, or, or possibly um, it, it, or possibly in another location. It really, um, yeah. it really depends on, if it is at another location, it really depends on the space. Um, and I don't mean that it has to be exactly the same, but the idea of, it's almost like a forwarding address, if you will, for the muses. So it, it, it needs to interact with, um, on that level with, with whatever building it, it does go into. All right, let's go for the next one, whoops. Uh, next one is a homage for the optimist. Um, simple background. Um, I've always considered myself kind of a stubborn optimist. So whenever I read a biography or come across somebody uh, of a similar um, similar tone and mindset, um, I always am very uh, very reassured. Um, and I said before, usually I start off with simple working drawings. This was an early one. Um, this was more of um, a um, more of like a rubbing 
if you will, of an early maquette that I made of the piece. And I, I call them figures. A lot of people see them as kind of chairs, but you'll see what I mean a little bit more. Um, so this was um, part of the maquette that I created just on a bandsaw using, I think it was four by four old uh, wood. And so it's a bunch of leaning figures that they kind of nest on each other. Now, if I can get the, oh, it works, great. Uh, if you look right here, there's a little 45 degree notch cut out. And so that's how the sculpture basically supports itself. Um, it creates a full octagon circle or cycle. And so it has eight of those figures. Oops. And that is one of the early maquettes. And so there's the eight figures that nest on each other. And then there's also one lone one, as you can see, that's separated, that doesn't quite have the, the same uh, width, which is intentional because I really wanted it to have it appear like it as if it was dissolving into the ground plane. Um, and if you look closely, one of the figures that's standing had its, its spine or back, if you will, has a very unique curve to it, unlike all the other ones, as if it is, instead of having its head down, looking down, it is looking up and out and over and with more of an open view. Um, and that is the final piece. It is made out of um, reinforced concrete. Um, there's rebar on the inside. Um, that circuit has a diameter of about uh, six, seven feet. Each one has about three and a half feet tall or so. Um, and then you can also see over here, the lone one that's kind of, I don't know if dislocated is the right word, but um, that's close. Like it is somehow removed itself or fallen away from, from the group. Um, and here you can also see the unique standing figure, which with that kind of curved back. Um, I was very fortunate. Um, we had a local, uh, local person in the Fort Point Channel area who very much liked it. I, I don't know who it was because it was anonymous, but they actually um, paid for it and got permission for me to install it on the corner of, um, what was it, Necco and A Street, a couple blocks away from, from Midway. Um, I like that photo a lot. It really gives an idea of scale. And if you look at the two-wheeler, you can really see the form more of the, uh, the curves back one. And I apologize for the fuzzy. Uh, picture, but that gives a good idea of scale, and that is um, where it ended up on the corner of A Street and Melcher. I'm sure that area is, uh, Neko, excuse me, I'm sure that area is going to be changing soon, but, um, and so that was up for um, about six months. Um, got a lot of very good positive feedback. I liked it, especially the location, because there's uh, a lot of traffic, but also a lot of pedestrian traffic. And um, it likes very much to be outside. That's its preference. <laughs> um, before I move on, any questions where, or where, comments? Where is it living now? Um, about 10 feet away from me. <laughs> It's it's uh, it's in temporary hibernation, and it's it, as I said before. Though it really loves to be outside, I, I really think it resonates um, yeah. much more outside. And and for a while, I kind of considered this piece as not the final piece, but even a maquette itself. I could I could Im imagine it being um, much larger to the point where maybe it maybe a person could almost use it as shelter if, it, if that kind of horizontal seat-like part was up maybe uh, eight or 10 feet. 
So, um, so wouldn't that be cool to have that in the new park that they're building? In where? The new park that they're proposing that goes from the channel to Wormwood. Sure. Yeah. I have a question. Were you inspired by brutalism? I love brutalism, actually. <laughs> it was very working class, socialistic architectural style. Yes. Um, also, I was inspired by my, um, my bank account balance because um, concrete, uh, I don't know where the prices are now, but it is very inexpensive. And um, and I, when I was at the museum school, I did a lot of um, mold making, not just with concrete, but smaller pieces with um, plaster and, and hydrocal. And so I created um, like a reusable mold so I could make multiples relatively quickly. And there was a whole unique process to it that um, for my partially attention deficit brain, I was able to um, keep a good focus. It kept me very much engaged. When in, when in the process did you decide to put the holes in them uh, that weren't in the, in the maquette? And I really love this piece. I'm sorry I didn't see it when it was up. Oh. Um, I, I wanted to give it more of a feel of, uh, of a figure. And I thought that negative space, that's kind of offset. It's not dead center at the top. Um, kind, of, kind of helped with that a bit. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it does. Uh, it, it is such a tender piece, I think. There is really some, some gentleness in it. Not only the volume, but also humanity. I think. Thank you. I'd love to have it out for people to be with it. People have to be with this piece. Hmm. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next one. Oops. Uh, this is called curved uh, totem series. Um, I think some of you folks might have might have seen this. Um, this one, whoops. Um, so curved totem series. And I said, as I said before, this is kind of, I'm doing it very linear presenting these slides. Um, so these are some of my early thoughts um, scratched down. So curved totem series, figurative abstract shapes thoughtfully arranged. Multiples of freestanding forms positioned, creating one formation, a flock or a herd of similar species interacting. Yeah, I went the right way. Okay, uh, this is uh, early working drawing um, where it does have more of a specific base, but I really wanted to have kind of this, this gentle curve leading upward into the sky. Um, this is when I was in uh, 218 over at Midway. This is where I created them. And again, I was using a mold. And this is a piece that just came out of the mold. Um, also poured concrete into a reusable mold and also reinforced um, you can't see it, but with with rebar, so they're very um, they're very durable and a little bit on the heavy side. the the um, The Optimus Peach piece, each one was about one hundred and sixty pounds. This one's about two hundred, um, which was interesting in the Optimus piece because that was almost exact same weight as myself, oh, wow. and um, it was a nice surprise. Um, I did a total of five of these. Three of them are for um, 
inside use only because that that tall curved vertical part in these um, are made out of wood. And once again, I'm using um, that same translucent fiberglass cloth that really um, embraces the light and really uh, has a wonderful glow to it and also acts like a barometer during the day as far as what time it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, really cool. Um, and each, each one of the, the height slightly ranges from about eight and a half feet to about six feet. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, the, um, they're almost ladder, like a curved ladder, but they just slide right into that negative space negative space right here mm -hmm. uh, on the base. Yeah. And I was hoping with that big cutout that um, they wouldn't quite be as heavy, but that was not the case. <laughs> and, and this is one, this was an outdoor one, a uh, little bit fuzzy slide, sorry, uh, but the top portion was not made out of wood. This one was actually made out of um, welded rebar. And, and that also can be gently pulled out of the base. It has two receiving holes in the base where the rebar goes into. Um, and I think that was in the, the famous Wormwood Park for a little while. And this one also um, very much likes to be uh, outside. Any comments or questions on the Curved Totem series? Uh, it is definitely about light, Bill. It is about light. Capturing, collecting light and giving light to people, to birds, to whoever is there. Such a beautiful piece, such a beautiful one. Is it okay if I use that word collecting, Olga, the next time okay. I describe it? Whatever you wish, everything is good. <laughs> Was that completely rigid? I mean, would that bend at all in a wind or a rebar? Yeah, it has a little give to it. Um, I haven't figured out exactly what its wind tolerances are, but um, I, I've always been in the camp that believes something is going to withstand the elements if it has a little bit of flexibility to it, instead of trying to make something so rigid. And I might even make a pretty great sound in a wind is what Ooh. I was thinking. It was placed right at the entrance of Midway, and I think they were doing a few years back some some outdoor light show, and somebody placed, which was okay, uh, somebody placed a couple of very strong light sources right behind it. So even though it wasn't the sunlight getting collected, um, it was uh, they had a strong colored light, and that was. That was very playful and, and fun. I, th I think it enjoyed that very much. I think it reflects your inner state, this shape, you know, heavy foundation being anchored to the ground and this desire to be like Icarus flying, you know, <laughs> to liberate yourself from that foundation <laughs> that's how i read it you know so it's it's you purple wow. yeah thank you it's um testimony about your you know like a mind state one one concept that i came across um through many 
critiques and conversations at the uh, museum school, um, which I started to, and I still employ, is bringing uh, dissimilar uh, materials together for the first time. So kind of a, a, a convergence of, of different materials, um, heavy, light, dense, opaque, translucent. Mm -hmm. hey, I'm gonna keep on going. Um, this is an ongoing series uh, that I'm working on and it's called a uh, very fancy name, the Fantastical Skateboard Prototype Series. And I'm going to zip ahead to a couple slides because I found one that has my intent on it. So let's go quickly, quickly. Here we go. Um, so it's an ongoing series. So it's recognizing the long history of using skateboard blanks, basically the skate, the board itself as a canvas, um, then expanding the parameters towards a more fantastical 3D sculpture. Um, skateboarding is something I've been doing since the mid 70s. I'm kind of dating myself, but it's been fascinating to see, especially over the last two or three, two decades, how much it has become a canvas for artwork. Um, so there are many, many uh, skateboards out there that you could use as a skateboard, but they're more prized as, uh, as a piece of two-dimensional art. So I'm trying to bring it more into a 3D place. Oops. So this was the first one that I did. Um, the line itself, is actually uh, wood burned into the wood. Uh, the wood itself is simple 3 8 inch plywood. Um, after I did the wood burning, um, I kind of filled in the, filled in the line, uh, the type of paint that I like to use, which still permits a little bit of grain uh, to appear. It's old uh, oil-based signage paint. So it dries extremely flat and extremely quickly, very quick. So there's really no going back, especially if, if, if the paint is diluted and getting into the grain. And then after the paint's all set, um, I uh, put many, many coats of uh, varnish on, on the board itself. Um, and this one is actual rendering of an exist, well, once existing uh, structure that was a World War II lookout tower um, that was positioned um, right outside uh, the Portland, Maine uh, Harbor. And so it was used um, to keep an eye out to see if there's any German U-boats on the horizon. And the history behind these towers that once went all up and down a lot of the East Coast, very fascinating. So if they could, if three of the people who were in the towers could see a U-boat, they would kind of use triangulation coordinates to actually pinpoint the exact uh, location. And I have a picture. The structure, unfortunately, was taken down just a couple of years ago, but um, but there it is. Um, obviously, it wasn't used much after uh, World War II, but I know in the I've heard rumors in the '70s and '80s that it was a very popular gathering place <laughs> for teenagers to go up, and some were brave enough to go up the spiral staircase all the way to the top. Um, this was about the next one that I did is it, it was called Diver. So you can kind of see a mask, a snorkel, and then some type of watery horizon in the back. This is the first time where I started to uh, relax a little bit and play around with um, wax colored crayons. 
the, the, the colors are in no particular order. Um, and they act, they, they penetrate through the surface of the 3 8 inch plywood. And there's a little bit more of a detail. And here's one of the more recent ones. I mentioned uh, Barbara Kruger earlier on who uh, was an artist in the late 60s, 70s, who um, worked more with text. And what I read is almost like a, like a PSA, like a public service announcement. Um, I have done this uh, silkscreen um, on a t-shirt, but also, whoops. There it is. So might have seen that before, but it's 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 kind of a, a tough love PSA, and it was created just when the pandemic hit. And the other fantastical skateboard prototype that I have is right here. Um, this one, also I'm using varnish, wood burning, but kind of that shiny tin foil um, is, is actually gold leaf. So that is beneath, uh, beneath the varnish. And this, this one in particular loves the light. And besides, besides the famous monk uh, scream painting, he did a few pieces and I really recommend trying to track them down that are, are wonderful where he would have either the moon or the sun rising or setting over the horizon, you typically over the water. So you'd have this nice round orb, you know, referencing the moon or the sun, and then the reflection on the water as it creeps out towards the viewer. Um, very simple, but uh, it, it just a very unique way of, of portraying a sunrise or a sunset or or the moon too. Um, they've always been very taken on that. I'll, I'll try to uh, circulate some of the uh, images of those paintings in the next couple of days. Um, any comments or questions? Did you, um, did, did you and, and uh, Yvonne, you know, the coyote, did you communicate about the skateboard metaphor? I, I know. You know, he's still teaching skateboard somewhere in in Barcelona now, I think. No, I haven't. Okay. I, yeah, I'm he, gonna write that down. He was, he was living here in Midway, gee, I don't know, six, seven years ago with Serena and Yvonne. Oh. Uh, and uh, he did some work with skateboards, visual art with it, but, you know, even more as a practitioner of skateboarding <laughs> as well as drawing and, and painting. I can get you his, his coordinates. He would love to see these things. And uh, you would love to know him. He's a great guy. I know another uh, early person who did uh, some of the skateboard art um, was uh, Keith Herring um, did a number of them. And, and I've seen a few of those and they're, they're wonderful as, you know, multiples of his, of his kind of playful figurines. Um, really in, enjoyed those. Um, the one I'm currently working on is um, kind of a, a reference to, uh, who was it, Woody, Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger, they used to have on their instruments, um, this machine surrounds hate and causes it to surrender, um, you know, a text. So I'm in the process of, of wood burning that very carefully around the perimeter. Um, so instead of this machine, I think I said this um, skateboard spelling it SK8, because that's the hip way to spell it. I've learned recently. And so this, this skate machine surrounds 
hate enforces it to surrender. And, and I'm happy with how that one's going, but the uh, you just need to take your time with the wood burning because there's there's no turning back. That's great. I love it. All right. What's next? Um, so I mentioned Maine before, and in that same community where the um, where that lookout tower is um, is where Sarah Dean and I go up occasionally in in the summertime. And since we don't have a gigantic van, or I, I don't really have a studio up there, um, I just bring a little small drawing desk, and um, and I have a bunch of pieces of that that kind of thick cardboard like chipboard paper and about five or six years ago um, I rediscovered all my old drafting tools um, my first year out of high school um, I tried one year of architecture um, and I realized that it wasn't quite for me but um, it didn't dissuade me or, or my love for um, using simple drafting tools to encompass um, in other triangles and things like that and, and really creating a nice um, consistent line. Um, so that's, so when I go up to, to Maine, I bring my little drafting table and then also um, some of my tools. And what's oh, not working, honey? Okay. Oh. So the size of these is about uh, 23 inches high and seven inches wide. As I mentioned, it is on chipboard paper. And I'm using graphite, basic uh, drafting pencil. And then once again, kind of filling in those spaces, those interior voids with um, with that very flat, quick drying, oil-based signage paint. Um, this the title for this one is called uh, Gimbal. Gimbal. Um, I don't know if you recall elementary school, but they would often have like a globe on an axis, so you could freely spin the globe, or maybe it was a a little model of the universe. Um, gimbals are often used in, in nautical applications. And then even you see them now a lot with um, kind of portable camera holders. So if you're moving with the camera, the camera itself um, stays very steady. It's, it's a fascinating device that's been around for um, a long time. And um, I was pleased with how this kind of base came out with the different tones. And then also that little, maybe it's a moon, I'm not sure, but how that has a little bit of a translucent character to it. Um, this is again, the same, same size, the same basic technique on the chipboard paper. Um, this is a little bit more powerful. Not quite sure what was going on at the time. It's called uh, Lies Through Eight. So we have almost like this serpentine character emanating from the ground, um, weaving its way through uh, the number eight and reaching upwards. Um, same size, this one is called Truth. Almost like the, looking at it now, almost like the flame of, of truth. Or, it's where, and it's, it's funny because in, in sculpture, I don't often use a base, but I find myself when I do two-dimensional work, creating some type of base. <laughs> Um, any comments or questions on these? I, I, 
I understand that I see they feel it as a drawing by sculptor. It is sculptor who created those flat art pieces. Isn't it interesting when you mentioned the base? I just understood that connection between your work in sculpture and your work in 2D. How very interesting. Well, everything is connected, of course. Very, very informative. <laughs> well, that was a big, big topic in sculpture history, whether or not to have a base or if you could just place something on the floor, does it need to have a pedestal? That's an, that's an ongoing, uh, ongoing conversation. <laughs> These are great. Where where are they now? Are they uh, in, in well, your place? Did they go somewhere? Um, funny you should ask. Uh, I've been I was busy over the springtime. I think like a lot of other people were um, documenting my work and even creating some type of spreadsheet for it. And I'm really not that advanced as far as the computer goes. I think as Mario knows, um, but. Uh, I have a very patient roommate, and she permitted me to uh, clear a large space in our studio. And so I have one full wall of many of these 2D pieces that I'm showing. And I, I tried to work out of my box, and, and it's basically hung in more of a salon style. So, um, so I am... Uh, I'm inviting um, friends and neighbors over. If everybody's everybody's vaxxed, very small groups of one to three people, um, and we can sit down and most uh, most welcome to take a, a look in person at some of these pieces. Um, I, I think I spent more time creating a light bar than actually uh, hanging the pieces themselves. So. These are these are great. I, I especially like this one. Do you do you title them or not? Yes, truth. this one this one is truth. That was my question. I yeah. see sharp object and some kind of a running blot behind that, <laughs> trying to sort of escape that truth. Uh, why do you call it truth? And that. A sharp object, of course, truth is painful, especially for capitalists. <laughs> hey, <laughs> well, of was, course, um, they hate truth. I was thinking of more of it being some type of uh, eternal flame, flame um, being being very pure. Uh, Bill, uh, one thing when you say that I just mentioned, it, I like the way it's deconstructed. So it could be a sharp object, but it is kind of a flame. But the idea of taking something that is so realistic and de making it into something uh, geometrical or surrealistic or whatever, that's I think is where these things are really beautiful. And it, Both of them. I see more of a flame, but I have heard people say um, yeah. that, that they see more maybe a crystal, some type of, as yeah. Milan was saying, something very sharp. Um, and I, I think that's interesting, valid interpretation. You know, everybody sees different things. Thank goodness. <laughs> How did you come upon the idea? Because I think it's a very strong notion of a plain air constrained by geometric tools. It is. Um, and there, there is kind of a contradiction there. Um, and, and when I'm outside and in the yard grading these things, people sometimes come over and go, oh, what are you, what are you, what are you painting or what are you drawing? And um, they're, I think they're expecting to see, you know, a beautiful, loose, quick watercolor where this is, it, it's definitely not the case. 
Um, for me, working with working with the the, the drafting tools um, is very uh, is very calming, and it's wonderful. Um, on, on all of these, I, I don't use um, numeric measurement. It's all through um, using the compass and the straight edge, a blank straight edge, and you know different triangles here and there. And I feel even even how I'm centering the piece on the paper. Um, that's all done um, with the compass, and it is it's remarkable how accurate. Um, a compass can be instead of well that needs to be two and seven eighths strong um, numbers after a while just become a blur um, it makes me think of, of something that newton supposedly said that uh, he he didn't think of geometry as math at all he thought of it as a branch of mechanics because it was basically manipulating straight edges and compasses and, and other mechanical. So it was more to him investigating the properties of mechanical things, which I think seems to me you're doing mm -hmm. in an artful way. Hmm. And, I, and I think the geometry, uh, I don't know if this is true for everybody, but I think uh, a lot of times people, and I think we're all quite, unique in our own way, but I think people, brains work and as far as math goes, usually a person is more of a geometry person or maybe a numbers and algebra person. It's very rare that you find somebody who's uh, very, uh, what's a fancy word, a draught at, at both of those. Because um, algebra, I struggled and struggled and struggled. But the first time I took, you know, geometry class, um, I was, I was able to, it just, it just clicked. It all made sense. Of course, all the angles within a triangle need to add up to a certain number. Um, to, to an interesting follow, observation. To follow Alan's uh, some example, you know, Pythagoras considered yeah. his, uh, theorem of the triangle as the art piece. And he even asked some theatrical people at that time to perform his, you know, triangle and cubes, you know. Uh, how is it in English that Pythagorova Vieta, so, you know, rule, Pythagoras rule of triangle. Theorem, yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. great. So uh, it was, uh, they understood it as the, the art forms also, yeah. Math, geometry, etc. Yeah, well, I never thought of it that way, Bill, that you can actually, uh, you can understand geometry, geometric things without resort to logic. You can just sense them spatially. Yeah. Ge geometries, visual, and other mathematics are theoretical, cerebral. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for those comments. Hey, I went the right way. Um, finally, uh, more sculptures. I might have a few more uh, that I'd like to show. And certainly if there's... Um, and you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more uh, about them after I go through them, or if there's a particular question or comment that you have, just let me know and I can, I can relocate the slide and everything. This is a piece um, that I did in our lower space here, uh, art under the stairs uh, early on. Um, it was called, uh, Detritus or Deatris, say it both ways. And uh, the length um, varies from about 10 feet, um, 12 feet maximum. And what they are is actually some of the old posts and beams of our beloved Midway building that were cut out uh, during the 2000 
to 2005 uh, renovation of the building. The building itself, as we all know, was built around the three different segments around averages, I think it's like 1912. So these are wonderful, um, so much character, these, these beautiful posts and beams. And I'm pretty sure that the type of wood that's used is uh, Southern yellow pine. So these are uh, arranged in certain way that just seem to fit the space and also what the timbers um, were kind of telling me when I was putting them, uh, arranging them, almost like a, like a flower uh, arrangement. Um, and then shortly after this picture was taken, I rem recall Olga making a wonderful piece um, right behind it. And that, that even, it liked the company very much, Olga. <laughs> very much. I remember. I remember that experience. I enjoyed it. I felt um, I felt relation to that piece. And my piece felt strong relation with it. And they were friends. Yeah. And sure, then when we would leave the space, they had their own life running <laughs> over there. <laughs> I think so, too. Um... Yeah, I went the right way. All right. Um, this was uh, another piece. It was called um, for an art show uh, downstairs called Sustenance. Sustenance. Uh, our Midway building, as we probably know, originally was created as a wool storage warehouse building. Um, so that is one of the key elements in this, which, which I consider a, a bunch of almost exaggerated uh, spools, if you will. Um, here's a detail shot of one of the spools. The diameter is about two feet. Materials that are being used are uh, bent copper tubing, um, two of them that kind of form those circles. And then also a uh, little burlap and the wood, which almost looks like shingles, uh, is actually cedar. And then the white puffy material is raw wool. And um, at the museum school, I had a wonderful mentor. Uh, I mentioned her before, no longer with us, uh, Joyce McDaniels. And we had a class called Material a Week, where we were giving uh, surprise material and then come back in a week with um, the beginnings or maybe a finished sculpture. And it, her thought was trying to get um, her students to really listen more to the material and, and trust, give yourself license and let, let the material really direct the work um, and that doesn't happen always right away, but if, if you spend time with the material, um, it, it really provides a whole new dimension potentially for the piece and you really listen to it. And, and the thing that struck me about this, um, I think we went to Vermont, with an old, uh, old mill town and they, they were selling uh, raw wool before before you'd get it processed. And um, I have very dry skin. And after a week or so of uh, forming and kind of stripping and ripping and bundling um, the wool, uh, all of the, the wonderful oils, uh, lanolin, or I'm not sure exactly what's in it, but just nurtured my hands. And it was it was very powerful usually when people use their hands a lot they they get kind of beat up a little bit but this one um it kind of not returned a favor but um was very medicinal and uh, uh 
the same thing happens whenever I work a lot with those little colored crayons. And uh, really quite something. With, and on the outside, you can kind of see it a little bit up here. That's just a clear, um, thin, very thin vinyl, almost like a heavy shrink wrap that just holds delicately everything, uh, everything together. And each one had a little tag on it with a with a with a name, I think. And there's a picture of the install. You can kind of get an idea with the height. And it's relatively freestanding, and they're just all stacked on top of each other, almost as if um, how sometimes people organize their firewood. And uh, the kids really like that one a lot because it's very, very, very tactile. Um, it was safe and, uh, you know, you didn't have to plug it in. <laughs> um, this was a recent piece just before the pandemic hit. Um, for some reason, strange reason, over the last 20 or so years, I my eye seems to catch and pick up uh, empty lighters. I'm, I'm not sure what it is. I think it's the colors or sometimes it's how the, the patina of the plastic has changed. And I do different things with them, but this, this one was a larger piece. It's roughly about three and a half feet tall, um, about two and a half wide in a depth of about three inches. And what I did was uh, poured a little bit of, on the floor, keeping it flat, poured a little bit of plaster, put in randomly, just dumped a bunch of lighters and then poured some more plaster in and I let it set. And then I went um, back again to kind of chisel out um, the lighters almost as if they were in snow or if they were in ice. And I, I didn't have any pictures or any maps where where I left the lighters randomly. So it was it was kind of a neat kind of excavation. Um, and that one's called lighters. Uh, you, know, you know, that's become a really popular kind of toy now for kids they, they get a lump of plaster and they have to excavate and find the things inside so it's you know, anticipated that that's a really pretty piece thanks that's that's also displayed in my studio it's kind of heavy but it's not going anywhere <laughs> um this one's titled um patch bay patch bay number one um it's a smaller piece it's about uh, seven by five, about two inches deep, and um, using, uh, once again, colored wax crayons. And if you look very closely, each one has a little uh, bronze wire coming out. Um, I think what was, what was going on, I was helping out some very near and dear friends move into a new, renovate a new recording studio. And I was always fascinated, and I still am, of all the different colored wires that they use um, in the studio uh, for all the, the signal flow, almost, almost like those uh, old pictures that you see of telephone operators with the, big, uh, with the big boards in front of them, all the holes, and they how they connect all the wires and, and complete the circuit and transfer different phones. So that was um, going through my mind a little bit. And I, I kind of think of it almost like an abstract fuse box too. Um, obviously there's no electricity involved, but um, I, I, like the, I like the playfulness of it. And now we're really bringing this up to date. Um, I said the current show that Olga is curating downstairs is uh, Midway Collection um, 21 
slash 22. And this is one of the, one of the pieces. Um, this is a, a thermo, thermo disc. And there's, there's multiples of these, about eight, eight of them downstairs. And um, this is another example of me listening to my uh, mentor, uh, Joyce, just relaxing and letting, letting the materials um, guide uh, the form and, and the arrangement. Um, the plates, uh, the backstory on the plates was that uh, years ago, uh, we have a little take it or leave it pile here at Midway and somebody let go of a big stack of these beautiful 1970s avocado green plates. And I liked them, but they're way too shiny. So I spent a long time removing the sheen. So, so they now have this very extra depth because they're so the there's no more sheen they're very very flat and the the object nesting on it um kind of pops more in the back back the backer the the, the disc becomes um this wonderful uh flat like uh, infant infinity type depth at least that's what that's what my eyes um, picking up on it. And I had some of these out on my workbench. And uh, for some reason, I woke up really early in the morning and the sun was coming right through. So that's all, all natural light. And that, um, that really pushed me, um, pushed me further to uh, complete, complete the series. Um, and last one, and this is also in the current show at the gallery. Uh, this is called uh, Patch Bay Number Two. Uh, the materials that are used are um, this black PVC flexible tubing, um, and also one of the thermo discs, and then also a uh, segment of an old uh, tree trunk that was um, harvested. Um, I, didn't, I didn't take it out of the ground, but actually our local little Wormwood Park. And I saw it sitting there for a couple of weeks and it just had so much character. And um, so I, I brought it over to Midway and spent um, a while cleaning it up and then also um, bringing out the wonderful grain and texture with uh, many applications of uh, varnish. And then also, once again, um, using the colored wax crayons, kind of inserting them very carefully um, on the, the, the top uh, where, the, where the tree would extend above the ground. Um, and then some of the tubes, as you can see, are coming out of um, kind of the appendages and then uh, going into the wall, or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe the maybe that tubing is coming out of the wall and then into um, the tree, and somehow um, creating a circuit and creating some uh, some type of energy um, for the piece. Um, I would like to take just a quick second uh, to. Um, the, uh, the show downstairs, the Midway Collection 21-22, was that um, I, I really worked, was, was challenged by the curator, our curator, to really work out of my comfort zone. And I'm very thankful for that um, because she asked me to wait for everybody else's um, piece to go up and then react to them. And that's, that's a very different way that I'm normally used to working. Um, and uh, so the word that has been, and somehow, somehow threading everybody's pieces together within the space, and the, work, the word that I've come up with is uh, coalescence, and which I think is an interesting verb it's kind of making many things kind of 
thoughtfully combining them into one. And um, in those uh, black PVC hose connections, um, when you visit the gallery, they kind of meander or thread through the whole space and which I hope uh, motivates the viewer to engage more fully with this space instead of anticipating like, if you will, like when you go to a museum, seeing the artwork on the wall, like, oh, I'm ready to see art. It's on the wall, it's perfectly centered. Where again, I'm trying to put, as I said before, art in an unanticipated spot. In this area, um, there's never been any art. And, and uh, so people are surprised when they see it. So the art starts the dialogue. And then also it can be, uh, which is very important, viewed from the exterior of the building. Pedestrians can, um, can see this piece. And also I have begun to, um, because there's a lot of continuing uh, tree foliage coming down in our wonderful city and other cities too, um, I'm starting to use that very similar technique of inserting uh, respectfully uh, a bunch of those colored crayons into uh, tree stumps on the ac exterior um, world, you know, not just in our local neighborhood, but starting to go over into the, the Cambridge area. Um, and I think it, um, without making a fancy artist statement all about it, but it's, it's, it's kind of trying to draw attention um, to these trees that are uh, a lot of times uh, taken down, I think, kind of unnecessarily and maybe even recklessly. Um, so it's bringing attention to uh, to the stumps, and, and I think that's kind of neat. Um, does anybody um, have any questions on the last little group that uh, or comments that that I shared? Bill, it's Mario. Yeah. I'm um, sorry, we might have some feedback, but I just wanted to ask you the materials that you found for uh, the disc. Yeah. Uh, is that something that you found on the street or uh, uh, I just love the, the whole concept of finding, it's almost like the Marcel Duchamp where he found <laughs> and then yes. putting things together into the, into, I found it very, very inspiring. By the way, thank you. Um, no, those I might have mentioned it before. I found those a few years ago. Um, not the plates, but the other materials. Oh, the not, other not materials. Oh, okay. What I put on the plates. Um, I, you know, I have I have a strange sense of sight. I don't th see things necessarily right in front of me, but I have very good peripheral vision, and a lot of times. A small colored object, maybe the sun is hitting it in a certain way, or maybe it could be like a broken, you know, brake light or lens or cover, and it has a certain color to it, a little bit of translucence to it. Um, it's very hard for me not to pick that up. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I have a, uh, a pretty good uh, um, collection of all these, these different. Um, little items Very cool. maybe you can sometimes consider to do uh, installation pieces from stolen things oh i i actually uh, it was one of the assignments i was giving to my students of performance art <laughs> just steal some object and create a performance with that <laughs> that is so interesting. It would be an interesting project if you two come together with that. A little bit criminal, but sounds interesting. You know, capitalism is based in stealing, so it's it's of just course. following the whole the philosophy of this system, you know. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not against anything. I just wanted to say that when I was enjoying the whole session today, I was thinking that 
when in the very beginning, Mario Avila Design came up with the face of that program 89, and I jumped up to the sky and understood right away that the program is designed to be running nicely. The beautiful face is, is important, whatever you put behind or before it, and the beauty has many faces as many faces and before before probably we will come to the conclusion of that session i wanted to retell it's not a quotation it it was said like 500 600 years ago then when the goodness is getting concentrated within itself to the point of necessity to go out it manifests itself in the light of beauty. And it is what we have seen today. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, I want to... No, I'd like to... But thank you all. And... Um, how are we doing with, with time, Mario? We are over time long ago. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Da, 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 da. Wow. Our, our hosts are the best hosts in the whole universe, I think. They're very patient and kind and everything. Right. Well, again, um, thank you. Thank you, Olga, um, for helping to get the 89 series uh, uh, initially going and Mario and I'm not sure if Hannah's still there, but for handling the technology uh, yay, uh, logistics and um, and the face, uh, the face of it, 18, 89, the face of the whole thing. When yeah. I see a new poster on the wall, I'm thinking, all right, we are here. <laughs> <laughs> and also, also Mario for doing a lot of the graphics. And I know uh, Joel Benjamin uh, contributed a lot of time with those wonderful photographs. Yes, uh, really, people really came together and create that beautiful flow. The flow of the show, the flow of this program, the flow of us coming together for creation of beautiful things. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, and please reach out if you want to visit. Love to have you over at the studio. Thanks, Thank Bill. You. Good to see you all. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I want to go. I want to go over to Milan's studio to steal some of the things for my next art project. Okay. <laughs> oh, especially, oh. especially beer. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> well, all right, everybody. Thank, thank you again. And, and have Bye, a good guys. Bye, Bye. Bye. Ciao. Ahoy. Bye. Ciao.